Good morning, everybody. It's well, I hope it's, hopefully it's morning for, for everyone, wherever they are. I am uh, Inga fabris Rotelli. I'm from South Africa. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to be the chair for this excellent session I think we're going to have today on spatial, spatial R, spatial analysis, spatial R. <laughs> I'm thinking about the plenary yesterday. So we have a, a really good lineup and I hope the session is going to be excellent. Um, so this is spatial analysis. The sponsor of today, just pointing it out there, is our studio for today. Uh, for the participants that are listening in, please, while the uh, um, presenters are presenting their, their talks, you're welcome to paste some questions in the Q&A. And then um, if, if you, you can also vote the questions and they will filter up to the top as the ones that most want to uh, be answered. And then uh, we'll have some time after each speaker to answer some, some questions. So I'm going to, our first speaker for today is, is uh, Lucas van der Meer. He's from the University of Salzburg in Austria. Uh, Lucas, you can uh, share your screen so long while I introduce you. He's got a geoinformatics background. Thanks, Lucas. Right, and he's going to talk to us today about SF networks, which are tidy geospatial networks in R. Um, and he's got some co-authors, I'm sure he will also there present to you. Thank you, Lucas, over to you. Sorry. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> that was not so smooth. Um, what I was saying is, uh, yes, I do have a lot of co-authors, uh, as you see here. Um, I think it happens that two of them are also in this room because they will also talk um, later in this uh, session. Robin Lovelace and Andrea Gilardi. And then the third co-author is um, Lorena Pat, uh, who is uh, not here, but um, yeah, that are that is our team um, that created this package called SF Networks, uh, which is about tidy geospatial networks in R. And what I'm gonna do now to give an um, to give an idea of what the package does, is that I'm gonna um, go step by step through this title of the talk so that we can really see, okay, what does this mean? Um, so tiny geospatial networks in R. The first part I'm gonna highlight is geospatial networks. What are, what are they? Yeah, so geospatial networks are networks that have nodes and they have edges like all networks, yeah, but in geospatial networks, these nodes and edges, they have a um, low, they are, have a location in geographical space. And so a node is somewhere in, in geographical space and an edge going in between two nodes is also somewhere in geographical space. Yeah, so these are, for example, road networks, river networks, um, which you also can take it a bit more to the abstract level of geolocated social networks or even a very hot topic now, epidemiological networks, if I say that work uh, good. Yeah, so there are a lot of types of spatial networks, geospatial networks are, are actually used in real life. Yeah? Normally we, we will model the nodes as being points yeah? and the edges as being lines that go in between these points. Yeah? And in contradiction to regular networks, let, let, let's say, yeah? um, the topology of this, of this network, so basically you have a node and this node connects to this other node and to this other node, yeah, only that information itself is not enough to describe the whole geospatial network. Yeah? Because besides this, you also have the spatial information in there, yeah, which, is an, which is an explicit part of your network. And when you analyze geospatial networks, then in, its, in most cases, very important to explicitly take this spatial information also into account. So that is why it's needed to have a specific tools to analyze geospatial networks compared to regular non-geospatial networks. So the second part I'm gonna talk about then is tidy in R. And I think most of you probably know what the tidyverse is. Yeah, it's a collection of R packages uh, made for data science and they all share the same um, philosophy and the same structures. Yeah? So this is this tidy data 
principle in which each row is an observation and each column is a variable. As I have in a small example, a very small table there, each row is an observation. In this case, it's a street and it has a variable name and a variable type to say what type of street it is. Then when we move this on to say geospatial in R, yeah, we get in our case, right, in our kind of data to the SF package. And the SF package is a very well-known now uh, package that's used for spatial data science. And it interacts very good with the tidyverse. Um, what the SF package does is basically it adds to each obser um, observation has um, geometry in space. Yeah, so we have this geometry column here, and that same gives for each picture, each of, um, observation has its own geometry, has its own location in space. And then the package contains a lot of uh, geometric functions where you can work with this data, um, possibilities to transform to other um, coordinate systems, and all these kind of functions are all bundled in this set package made for spatial data science of spatial vector data. So there are points, lines, polygons, and these kind of um, features. And it's, as I said, it interacts very well with the um, tidyverse. And then um, an example, for example, we have here a set of lines, yeah, and we can trans transform this into different uh, coordinate reference systems. We can, for example, also create our own geometry on top of that, yeah, which then we can use in a geometric oper oper operation where we, for example, say, we want to only keep those lines that are intersecting with this additional polygon that we made. Yeah, and we end up with something like this. Yeah, so this is a, something that as that, for example, can, can do. Um, then networks in R. Yeah? That's where I want to introduce the package tidygraph, yeah? which is a tidy interface to the larger iGraph library. And iGraph is a very large library with a lot of algorithm implementations meant for graph theory. Yeah? So networks, um, but not focused on spatial networks. Yeah, and what Tidygraph does um, is that it says, okay, iGraph has a lot of tools, but it doesn't fit really good into the Tidyverse way of working. So they created this package, et cetera. Okay, this way we bridge basically between iGraph, which has all the algorithms and the Tidyverse way of working. And yeah, because uh, Network in itself is not really can be modeled as tidy data, but what tidy graph says, well, at least we can have the two different com components of the network, so the nodes and the edges, those we can model themselves as being tidy data rates. And then two together, they form one object that then represents the network. So that's what you see here at the right. We have one network but with one table which represents the nodes, in this case, the nodes have a name, and one table that represents the edges. And that tells us also, okay, from which node to which node does this edge actually go? Yeah? And of course, Tidygraph is then also in that way very good um, to work with the other Tidyverse set of packages. An example, you can use all the Tidy first verbs that you might know, like mutate um, and, and all these other verbs directly on your network. You, know, you just first have to specify do I want to apply this action to my nodes or to my edges? Yeah, that is how you can use these normal tidy verse verbs on your network. What comes on top of that is that um, they, of course, you can use all the iGraph algorithms that are specifically meant or graph theory. Yeah, a small example is, for example, calculating the centrality. So that's what you do here. You calculate the degree centrality for the nodes, and you calculate the between the centrality for the edges. And you can do that with your tidyverse verbs and using the pipe structure uh, that you probably also know. Yeah. Of course, that means that you can also just add a geometry column 
to your network, you know, where you say, okay, my nodes actually have a, lo have a location in space, what I do here. But the problem here is that TidyGraph doesn't know about um, what to do with this. You know? It just sees it as another attribute of your nodes, but it does not know how to deal actually with the spatial information. So for example, the nodes that I've just added here, yeah, they are uh, in space, they look like this. But when I plot my network, TidyGraph doesn't, doesn't know that. Right? It, it, it cannot deal with, uh, with that. So there is a need to explicitly incorporate space into these networks to really give a good tool to analyze geospatial networks. Um, and here's just a tweet that said, okay, one of the biggest reasons that people still use RGS is actually because there is not a really good general purpose network tool that we have in, in um, phosphor G and also in, in, in R. Yeah, so then our idea was, okay, we want to combine as a and Tidegram to get one package for spatial networks, which is called asset networks. And, and the idea here is that in Tidegram, they say, as I said, a close approximation of tidiness or relation or, or network data yeah, is having two tidy data frames, one describing the no data and one describing the edge data. And then we say, okay, we extend this to the geospatial field, bring it, bringing SF in there, that the close approximation of tidiness for geospatial networks is a collection of two SF objects, one having point geometries for the nodes and the other having line stream geometries for the edges. And that looks like this. Yeah, so we can start with just a set of lines and we can create a network out of that, and it will at each end of the lines, it will create a node, and when these ends of the lines are shared, there will be one node there which connects basically um, the edges to each other. Yeah, so directly we can jump from only lines to a network representation. Then we can do again, and oh, this uh, is then in, uh, in code, so we start with only lines, and we create a network out of it, and it looks like this. We have nodes with a point geometries and edges that line stream geometries. Then um, we can, for example, extract every, um, um, nodes or edges again as an as that, uh, object to have a good interaction with um, as that. Um, also, we can extract the geometries. We can use the SF functions to transform our network into a different CCC. CRS. This all works out of the box on this geospatial network structure, this SF network cloud. Also, when we want to do this uh, filter that I showed before, here we have our network. We have this polygon there we want to say we only want to keep that part of our network that intersects with this red polygon there. And then we get this. So all these SF functions work directly out of the box on your network um, on object, on your SF network object. The same is for the Tidy graph functions. Yeah, so here we have our network again. We can do the same as I showed before. We can calculate, for example, the betweenness and centrality of the nodes. And this will be added here as a column um, to the nodes. I don't know if you can see it. Um, here. Uh, here, down here. Yeah, so we can use this tidy graph verbs also directly on our network object. So this brings together the functionalities of SF and of Tidygraph, which has iGraph in the back, together in one class that is meant for geospatial networks. Yeah, and then, for example, we map it now. Yeah, now the object actually knows what to do with the with the um, space. Yeah? So space is explicitly taken into account in these objects. Um, so that is the core. The core is that we have one class that is can be used both with the set functions and with tidy graph functions. These two worlds are basically brought together into one uh, class. Of course, there are some extra things that are not covered in tidy graph, neither in SF, and in that way we add some extra functions that are really specific for spatial networks. We we add it on top of these functionalities from our two parent packages. And for this, I can go really fast. It's just showing some, some plots. 
For example, we have a lot of pre-processing and cleaning functions. Here we have a very dirty network. You see loops here, um, which can be easily taken out um, to have a more simple network. We can also um, subdivide edges at points where actually an edge crosses each other, but there is no node. Um, we can remove pseudo nodes, which are these nodes that are that only have an edge at both sides, but are don't really form an inter um, section. We can simplify in, in intersections, as you see here. And we can also snap points to our network. For example, snapping geospatial points to our nearest node, which then works like this. We can also snap points directly to their nearest edge and include them and a new node in our geospatial network, which looks like this. And so all these additional functions are not covered in the set, nor in Tidygraph, there are specific geospatial network functions that we have on top. Um, shortest path calculations, of course, is very, very important. And in, as a network, you can also give points that are not already a node in the network. Yeah, so you can give any point, it will find the nearest node, and then calculate the shortest path. So this is also functionalities that we added on top of what is already there. Um, cost matrices between all pairs of nodes is also in there. And a lot more, which I cannot cover all now because I think I'm already out of my time. Um, but I think I, what I can say is we're very proud of that we have already kind of a good documentation where we cover everything that the package does now. Um, you can install it, of course, from Cron also now. Um, and mainly I want to ask, look at the docs if you're interested. Um, but also, if you have ideas or if you want to contribute, please go to GitHub, write an issue, write a dis um, um, discussion topic, um, because the package is still relatively new. It already can do a lot of stuff, but also a lot of stuff it cannot do yet might be sometimes buggy. So um, we are really happy if you want to join in uh, and make this package uh, better. So that was um, it. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Wonderful. Um, I see there is a question. We'll do just two questions, I think, and then we move on to the next presentation. Uh, Kenneth asks, how can you use uh, SF networks in a hierarchical network, like a river drainage network system? Um, so this is actually a point uh, <laughs> that this is not really my field, so I'm, I cannot answer really that uh, question. But I think the real goal that we have for this package is that it's a general purpose package, so not focused on one specific application. And it also means that the package is probably useful for a lot of applications that I don't know uh, that I don't know uh, about. So sorry, I cannot specifically answer your question, but I do think that since it's a general purpose package, that there might be a lot of possibilities to also use it for your application. And if it cannot do everything that you need to use it as a base or a new package, that then specifies for your specific application, but uses this data structure as a base. Um, that is basically the goal that we have with the package, to create something general purpose that can be used as a base for also the more specified pack packages that go into one specific um, application. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> there's one more question. I just want to ask Robin to start sharing so long while you answer it. Um, Martijn asks, um, how was the development of the SF network package initiated? What triggered the team to start working on it? Well, actually, it was started. Um, I did during my master studies, I had an R course, um, and we had to do a um, homework where we had to create an R package. That was actually the first start where I made something very small. Um, and then came in contact with um, Robin Lovelace, where she liked the package and said, we should push this on, we should really make something bigger of this. Um, and along the way, other people joined in. Um, 
So yeah, it, it started as a small hunger room project and slowly got to something more that is now actually already used by, I think, quite a lot of people, and which, which makes us very happy. Very, yeah, I personally am going to make use of it. It looks really excellent. Thank you, Lucas. We'll, there's some time right at the end of the session if people want to ask Lucas more questions. So please put them into the Q&A and we'll hold them for there. But uh, just to keep the time correct, we're going to move on to um, Robin and Rosa's presentation. Hiya. Um, just to check, can you hear me okay? I can hear you, Robin. Where are Fantastic. you? Because my, my uh, video is not currently working because I've just... Okay. Um, been doing an online tutorial and uh, I don't I if I um, stop that I think the whole session will end so apologies uh, yeah you can't uh, <laughs> but the you can see the screen so that's the main thing that's the main um, thing I can hear you is Rosa online as well just to check hi she, is there Rosa? yes we can hear you Rosa hi Excellent. Rosa uh I, I cannot share my video but okay anyway I, I can, uh, oh because you're not a car host share. Yeah, I, will, I'm happy to do the to do the, the, the slides. Sure, Rosa, I'll try and make you co-host in the meantime, um, so that when you start talking, that your ca you can turn your camera on. I'll Thank work on that so. while Robin is speaking. So it's my pleasure to introduce Robin Lovelace and Rosa Felix. They are going to talk to us about slopes, a package for calculating slopes. Very well, good apt name. Um, Robin is an associate professor of transport data science at the University of Leeds. Um, I think we all, if you're in spatial, you know who Robin is. So we're really looking forward to your presentation. Thanks, Robin. Thank you so much for the intro. And uh, yeah, we'll be talking about slopes. It's a nice uh, short package name and kind of does what it says on the tin. It calculates slopes. Um, that's a surprisingly um, hard thing um, to do. Um, we, we, we assumed that this data would be out there on slopes and kind of take, taken for granted when you're going, when you're walking up a hill, you can say, this is a steep, uh, this is a, a, a steep road. Um, but actually there doesn't seem to be that much quantitative accurate data on that so um yeah that's what we mean by slopes how steep are roads primarily uh, which is what um we we've been looking at but we also think and hope it can be used for other areas of research so rivers and i'd be interested to hear of other potential use cases uh, we think the uh, methods are generalizable and we're just going to talk about what we've done. So yeah, you've introduced me. I'm uh, Robin and Rosa. Um, we've, this is a collaborative uh, project, so that's why it's a dual presentation. And Rosa, do you want to just introduce yourself? Uh, sure. So I'm Rosa. I'm based in Lisbon, Portugal. Uh, I work with the University of Lisbon in uh, active transportation. Uh, and my background is uh, civil engineering and geography somehow. Yeah. Great. So um, yeah, and we've got um, quite a detailed uh, presentation on the package. Um, there's a lot of things to consider in relation to slopes. So why slopes in the first place? Uh, some of the key functions so you can actually start using it um, and future plans. So nice, simple structure to our presentation. And yeah, the uh, first thing to say is um, this map kind of highlights each of the, uh, our motivation for uh, creating this package. The map was actually created by Rosa and it, it provides estimates of the road gradients across a large road network in Sao Paulo. And this is something that people are interested in. So. On social media, there was plenty of people talking about this and using this to talk about issues with transport provision. So um, yeah, we'll, we'll come on to why people find this so interesting. And um, it also shows that although we're presenting um, the methods, you can use this now. So if you've got a city and you wanna calculate uh, or any other system and you wanna calculate the uh, gradient, um, you can use this package right now to, to do that. So uh, yeah, just going into a bit more uh, detail on that. So 
we do want to solve real world problems. This isn't a purely for fun, although it is quite a fun package. Um, and existing tools just weren't up for the, to the job. So um, yeah, Rosa and I have been collaborating on uh, tools for estimating cycling potential. And this is especially important in cities like Lisbon, uh, where Rosa's based and also Sheffield, where I uh, have lived um, in the UK. And the importance of gradient uh, from cycling perspective in particular is highlighted by this uh, graph on the right, which is from a 2017 paper on the propensity to cycle tool. Um, and this just shows that on average, so uh, the blue line is average percentage of uh, commute trips made by cycling. And on the y-axis, you've got the average route gradient. And you can see that gradient is almost as important as distance. So uh, when you, you, you get almost a 50% uh, decline in cycling, um, just as you go from zero to 1% average gradient. So just emphasize this is average gradient, not the steepest segment in a route. But in many cycle models, uh, cycling models, this is kind of ignored. And many transport models, they don't take into account uh, route gradient. And even when they do, and this is a critique of the um, paper that this is taken from, sometimes they only take simplistic measures of hilliness, like the average gradient. But in fact, if you think about walking or cycling, it's not the, the average gradient, it's the steepest section. So the point there is you could have an av a route in which the average gradient is 1%, and it's just a constant 1% slope, which you may not even notice, or you might have a route that is completely flat, except for the last, um, the last part, which could have a gradient of 10%. So um, that's, that's a kind of real world need. And Rosa has um, been using Esri's 3D analyst. So that gives you estimates of slopes, but it's not easy to reproduce. Most people don't have an Esri uh, license and it's hard to scale this up to national level analyses, especially if you're using um, their cloud-based providers where you have to pay per use. So we wanted a, a free and open source solution. And we had a look and we simply couldn't find a solution that um, met our needs. So um, this sounds like an ideal R programming challenge. We both love geospatial data and um, we decided to uh, look at this and try and uh, provide something um, that could do it. So in terms of applications, yeah, we th um, transport planning um, can make a lot of use of slope data. Obviously, there are many attributes on uh, road segments. What kind of road is it? How wide is the road? but um, slope can inform many aspects of uh, transport planning, especially active travel planning, but also logistics. So if you're moving hundreds of heavy goods lorries around, you need to think about slope in terms of um, the efficiency and the route planning. And then also in terms of river and flooding research and civil engineering, when you're thinking about the uh, probability of a building uh, shifting or moving. So um, although we haven't used the package for these other applications, um, they do exist and we um, suspect that there are other areas where this could be useful. And there's also a more prosaic and fun use of slopes, which is illustrated by this graphic in the center, which shows the relationship between this is walking speed on the y-axis and then gradient. So this is basically mountaineering. If you are planning to a route in mountainous areas, this is the kind of thing that you need to consider. And it shows that you have quite an interesting relationship between a gradient. So basically when your gradient is zero, you're close to your fastest speed. But if the gradient drops to maybe um, minus 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 1%, 
you're slightly faster because you're going downhill. But when you start going really steep, um, again, you slow down because um, it's too steep to walk normally. You have to go carefully. And obviously the same applies when you go to higher gradients. So that's just another use that if anyone's into hiking, perhaps you could use the package to help uh, plan your route and provide a more accurate estimate of the time that it's going to take, taking into account the route. Okay, so getting on to the details of the package, um, it's not currently on CRAN. Uh, we definitely plan to publish this on CRAN, but currently uh, you can install it from GitHub. So this exists on the ITS Leads um, GitHub organization, and you can install it um, with this command and then load it by uh, the usual way, library slopes. And then for the purposes of this presentation, we're also going to be using the TMAP package for data visualization. And um, the package has got some key functions. So um, slope X, Y, Z, I really like this uh, function because it kind of adds on the elevation data silently and it takes advantage of a new feature of the SF package, which is you can have three-dimensional coordinate systems. And I'll show you what we mean by that. Uh, slope raster, that calculates the slope based on a line string, like you've got an example here from Lisbon and a raster data set. And again, I'll show in more detail what, what we mean by that. Uh, slope 3D, so that um, adds the third dimension to line string uh, coordinates and then plot slope uh, plots a horizontal profile associated uh, with a line string and we're going to provide examples of each of these but um, just to show you uh, the kind of thing that we're talking about very quickly um, this first uh, command takes a data object uh, Lisbon root 3D um, it breaks it up into different segments and then it calculates the slope. So slope X, Y, Z here is calculating the slope and then we can see what the slope is. And um, when we generated this plot, we thought of another use case, which is people who have limited mobility who may find it difficult um, to travel. So moving rapidly on, the two main inputs are line strings. So this is like a root network and then on the right, you have a, um, a map that is a raster image where you've got pixels with average height. And combine the two together, um, and with this slope 3D, it's basically just adding the, X di the Z dimension. So this is X, Y, and then after applying this command, you've got X, Y, Z. And you can plot that using the plot root. So on the left, you've got the before, which has no X axis. And, and then on the right, you've got this really rich and valuable information um, about the gradient at different parts along the route. You can also calculate slopes when you don't have a digital elevation model. And um, this uses the map box um, elevation profile data, and we've cal we've generated an example for the case study city of Zurich, uh, which we where we probably would be if it wasn't for the pandemic, and that just shows that you can use this um, to calculate routes um, in other cities where you don't have a digital elevation model. So I'm going to hand over to Rosa now, who's going to talk about using this um, on a bigger case study. So over to you, Rosa. Okay. So yeah, I'm going briefly describe how to use this for a larger data sets. Uh, sometimes you have some limitations with the API keys. Uh, so if you want to uh, calculate slopes for a large uh, root network, uh, this can be very useful because it uses uh, a local raster uh, that you can um, freely download for many uh, services such as uh, SCRTM, NASA Mission, or Copernicus for Europe, well, or other uh, local agencies that sometimes have uh, more detailed 
uh, raster uh, available. So um, here we we used um, for this example of uh, Isle of Wight, uh, we used the OSCM extract that you can uh, later see uh, the talk uh, of Andrea and uh, the T map to make uh, just a thematic map. So uh, we just download the network from um, uh, OpenStreetMap, um, and then we we made use of um, of a, a, a data set of uh, a raster data set uh, from uh, a CRTM, and then we just plot them together just to see if they overlap and if everything is okay. And as you can see from the image, you might expect to see some steepness on the south area of the aisle and in the central area too. Um, yeah, there it is. Um, so then we will proceed to calculate slopes for each segment. So this is a, a fast procedement uh, for this um, road network that has about 23,000 23, uh, uh, segments. It took about uh, six to seven seconds. So it's uh, about 3.4 thousand seconds per second, which is kind of uh, fast. Uh, and just for curiosity, as you can see with the summary of the calculated slopes, you have uh, like the, the mean gradient is about 4%. Uh, and uh, half of the, the, the segments as about 3% gradient, which is, I mean, if you think about cycling, 3-4%, uh, it's already a little bit uh, steep. And uh, if you look at the, the maximum, it's, that's more than 100%, it's 152%. That's very, very steep. And of course, it's probably um, some stairs, some uh, cliffs, uh, you then can look at it with more detail uh, and maybe Robin also can talk about that uh, issue that we sometimes face uh, when we don't have a proper um, base map for um, like uh, for elevation information um, or even the segments that are uh, pretty um, small sometimes they can induce uh, this uh, difference uh, and very steep segments. Uh, okay, so uh, here is a, just a quick thematic map, which is this uh, classification for um, for steepness. And in this case, it's for uh, cycling. So we consider 3% flat, 3, 3 to 5% uh, mild. And then we have the extreme and kind of impossible <laughs> Uh, uh, road segments. Uh, so Robin is just pointing to some example. Uh, okay, so there you go. This is um, interactive base map, and uh, if you if you look at our vignettes uh, at slopes package, there's a step by step guides to to produce these uh, thematic maps for any given city, as long as you have. Open street maps, uh, and it's covered by a digital elevation uh, model. Yeah. So, yeah. So, if you don't have any of any digital elevation model in your machine, you can um, play with the, the existing package data. So, there is the Lisbon road segments, which is a small portion of uh, central Lisbon, which is um, um, have has very different um, uh, gradients of the streets. You have a flat downtown and very steep hills, uh, east and east. Um, so th this is one uh, one uh, small uh, road segment uh, example, and you also have the. Um, the DEM Lisbon raster, uh, which is the, the digital elevation information for this area. That this comes with the, the package, and you can play and try yourself uh, by using this um, these functions and names. 
So our future plans, we are almost in the end. Um, we want to, one of the functions that we want to develop is to get the a digital elevation model data directly from the slopes package. Um, another uh, option but that we would like to, to have is uh, not using only um, uh, Mapbox, um, Mapbox service, but also other services uh, such as uh, Cycling Streets or even Google Terrain or other available uh, services using APIs, of course. Uh, also to improve plot slope function for visualization of the, the segments, maybe in 3D uh, or even improve the palette color or uh, other aspects of this visualization. And then more in the research area to explore the accuracy that, that these results give to us uh, with the ground truth, to compare them uh, to make some benchmark with other available um, softwares that also give us uh, slopes results. Uh, we also need to, um, this is already submitted to peer review uh, in uh, our open site. Thank you, Robin. Uh, so <laughs> this, um, we just need to finish the, um, the review and then try to publish in uh, the journal um, of open source software and of course on CRAN. So uh, if you want to get involved and contribute for these future plans or other ideas that you have, you can uh, go to our GitHub um, repo that uh, lives on ITS leads slash slope and uh, get involved. Robin, do you want to add something? Um, no, yeah, that, that's, that's basically the plan. The only other thing that um, I was thinking of saying is just the links between this package and other packages on this spatial session. So Luke mentioned um, the, um, was talking about the SF networks package. So perhaps we could use data from the SOAPS package when you're doing routing, and that could be in the weighting profile. And all of the data that we've used is downloaded using the OSM extract. So it fits into this ecosystem of spatial packages. So that's the only thing that I wanted to say, but yeah, I think that's everything. Um, unless anyone has any questions on the package. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Rosa. We're, we're a little bit uh, tight for time. So I'm going to let the other presenters present and then hopefully at the end, because there are some questions for you in the Q and A, and then we can, we can uh, open those again at the end. Um, just in the interest of time, but thank you. That was really excellent. Um, our next speaker is Timothée <laughs> Girard. He's from the French National Centre for Scientific Research. I'm sure I said it completely wrong and I apologise. No, 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 that's okay. <laughs> You're welcome to share your screens. Your screen. Um, the panellists have shared some links in the chat to their, their packages as well as their slides. Uh, just a message for all the attendees. Okay, Timothy, off you go. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. So uh, today uh, I will present uh, this new package, uh, MapSF, <coughs> which is a, a package for thematic mapping. Uh, thematic mapping, let's say, how you put statistical uh, data on a map. It's like uh, statistical mapping or thematic maps. The uh, idea of MapSF is to to obtain maps that are uh, uh, publication ready with all the feature or with all the map features that are uh, compulsory for scientific maps. So the legends and the, the, the maps, the map layout, etc. So this is a first example of, uh, of a map that okay. is... Uh, the next session. That has been all, uh, fully done with uh, MapSF. Uh, I, I'll start with a, a bit of uh, technical uh, uh, information. So MapSF is built on a, a small number of uh, well-known dependencies. Uh, I mean, it, it depends only, it depends on uh, SF uh, heavily. Uh, the, all the 
the computation within the package are done uh, with ASAF. And some of them also use uh, ClassInt to, uh, to break uh, uh, continuous data into classes. And uh, uh, two or four uh, functions use RCPP. So, but it was uh, intentional. I mean, I, I tried to keep the number of uh, dependency uh, pretty low. So the um, MapSF package is based mainly on one function, which is mfmap. And with this function, you can plot all sorts of uh, statistical maps. It adds uh, three main arguments. The first is x, and uh, is it, uh, it takes uh, an SF object, uh, a point uh, for points, lines, or polygons. The second argument is uh, var, which is used to, in to indicate uh, uh, the name of a variable in your SF data frame. And the third argument is map type, which indicates what kind of maps you, you want to use. And uh, there is nine map types that you can create with uh, mapSF and its uh, function uh, mfmap. Uh, you can create a, a base map. It means we, without uh, a statistical data, it's uh, a, a wrapper around the plot st geometry. And you can plot uh, uh, proportional symbols, uh, typology maps to plot categories, uh, choroplet maps. Uh, you can also use graduated symbols. And for all these uh, map types, you can use points, polygons, or lines. And there is also four other types uh, to plot symbols. and. Um, or to, to combine two uh, map representation. For example, uh, prop coro, you can plot uh, proportional symbols that are colored uh, according to uh, a second variable, like in a coroplet map. Apologies, Timothy. Yeah. There's just a request that you try make your presentation full screen, if, yes. if, if that's possible. Yes, of course. Thank you. That's yes, that's wonderful. Yes, okay. that's much better. Thank you. Okay. Sorry. Uh, so I tried to to keep the the documentation of the of the package uh, quite tidy. Uh, all the the arguments are well documented. I hope. And in uh, since there is only one main function, it's uh, it's um, a, a compact documentation yet complete. Um, besides this main function mfmap, there is also uh, a few functions that helps to add map layout elements, like uh, the title, you can place it uh, on the right, on the left, choose the color, and so on. You can add uh, north arrows, credits, uh, uh, a, a bar scale, you can add a shadow, uh, labels, and um, annotations. Now I, I will try to, I, I have created a, a small example that uh, use some features of MapSF. So the first line here, um, I use a function mfgetmtq, which is uh, used to just to, to load the sample data set on uh, uh, Martinique municipalities. And then I want to create a coroplet map. So I, I indicate, uh, the SF object for the X argument, the variable I need to plot, which is med, it's the median income, and uh, <clears throat> the map type, which is coro for coroplet. So uh, it's pretty easy and quick to plot uh, an, uh, uh, a simple map just to, to, see the, to see the spatial organization, but very quickly. And then I can add uh, some arguments to select the, um, the color palette, the methods to, 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 to make the continuous variable uh, in, uh, in classes, the number of breaks, and some arguments for the, the legend, the title, the number of digits, 
and uh, its position. The next step is to add some uh, layout elements, the title, the credits, and the scale, and a north arrow. And then there is also uh, another function that, uh, that can be used to create, to, to select a, a map team. So it's uh, this line here, and I use uh, um, an SF data set, so the MTQ, to center the map on this uh, uh, element, and I select uh, a team by its name, which will uh, modify the, the foreground color and the background color, the position of the title, is it on a tab or so on, and some uh, default color for the legends. Then the, in the next uh, operation here, I add uh, a shadow on a map. So you see a, a little dark shadow, which is uh, aesthetic. And then here, there I, I, just, I have just added uh, an inset of a world map uh, with the function MF inset. We can be set on and off. Uh, I indicate the keyword world map and its position. And then with the function MF world map, it automatically uh, creates um, uh, a world map with a symbol on the position of the SF object. Then I close the, uh, the inset. I, I will go back to this function uh, later. And on this map, I see that the, the, the island is uh, on the center of the map of the figure, let's say, and I want to uh, to put it a bit on the left to make it more uh, balanced visually. So here on the MF init function that starts and initiates the function, I can use the argument expand BB to uh, add a little margin on the on the right. So with this block, uh, with this with this code here, I can create this map. Um, so pipes, are, we can use pipes with uh, MapSF because the MF map function um, output is the, it, it, the, th this function will return invisibly the X argument. So if I use MTQ as input here, it will go within MF map and then within MF map for the proportional symbols. And it works with the native pipe as well as with the migrator pipe. So I already talked about the inset, but of course uh, you, you don't have to, you can plot something else. Uh, you're not, uh, it's not only the world map, you can select uh, an element in the map which here I take only the, the first municipality, and I say I want it uh, to have a, a sex of uh, dot three, which means one third of the width of the, of the figure. And for the teams, uh, I, uh, uh, I added some, uh, some teams, like uh, a dozen or so. And what's changed on the teams is the background, the foreground, the position of the of the title it can be inside the the map like in the darkula theme or outside like in the ink or green theme and you can also uh, fully customize one theme and create it uh, uh, from the from the start from the beginning the the package goes with a, a website created with package down. So, and in this, uh, this website, you can access um, the main vignette, which explain uh, like, a, like I do today, the, the principle of the packages, the main functions. And it also uh, have uh, a complete, not a complete, but a, a large set of uh, uh, code uh, examples to, to display the main map types. For example, this is the code for the base map, 
but you have also examples for proportional symbols, coroplet map, typology, uh, the combination between um, two variables. So here is it's an example uh, with prop coro. So we will have proportional symbols and uh, a coroplet coloration within. And to you, you will have to select two variables and for some elements, two uh, a vector of two. For, here is for the legend position, for example. So uh, we also have a vignette to create uh, to that detail how to create a mapping set. And one thing I, I wanted to show you is that uh, when you start an inset here, in fact, you can plot whatever you want in it. Uh, if, it's, if it is in uh, base or graphics, not a ggplot. So here I created an, uh, an inset on the top right corner, and I just draw uh, an histogram of the, of the classes. So if you want to create a, a full map within the, the inset, it's possible. There is also a vignette on teams where uh, you have the parameters of the current teams. Uh, explanation are all to modify an existing team or all to create it uh, from, uh, <clears throat> from the beginning. And the last vignette <clears throat> is dedicated to, to explaining how to export maps, because uh, you know it's, it can be difficult to export uh, figures with, uh, with R, and you have to, to design to, <clears throat> to, sorry, to decide the, the width and the height of the figure. Here with the MF export function, that can export in uh, PNG or SVG, you just select one side of the figure and the other uh, is um, automatically deduced, uh, taking into account the ratio of an SF object. So here I just selected uh, my SF object MTQ and select the width and the height is automatically, automatically um, decided. So thank you. Here yeah, you, you will have the, um, the link to the website, the link to this presentation, the GitHub uh, repo for the, the packages, my Twitter handle, and my uh, a link to my, uh, to my blog. So I'm, uh, I will happily take a question if you have some. Thank you, Timothy. I think we've got time for one, maybe two questions. Um, so there is, uh, Shimilas asked, is it possible to do, uh, to, I suppose, incorporate the map in Arch EIS, but what is the benefit of using the program language? Oh, it's possible to, to do this in ArcGIS to create a map like this. What is the benefit of using um, R for this instead? Okay, that's a, a broad question. So uh, the point is to, to stay in R basically. So I, I create my analysis with R, uh, downloading data, uh, tidy analysis and so on. And then I will go as far as I can with R to produce a production ready uh, edit uh, a, a map to avoid to, to have to use some other tools like uh, Inkscape or, or so on. So, and also, of course, for reproducibility, maps are figures, like any figures, like a graph or like a, uh, a table. It's a, a part of an analysis, so it, it has to be uh, uh, it has to be reproducible as well. Exactly. Um, okay, and then while Andrea starts sharing his screen, there's two questions I think you can answer quickly. The one is: Is it possible to export in TIFF format? And then, are you planning to incorporate ggplot2 insets? Um, automatically in the future. Okay, uh, so it's not possible to use to export TIFF format for now, but it 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 would not uh, it should not be too difficult to 
to create the or to add this format to the MF export function. For now, it's only uh, PNG and SVG. And the and the um, sorry if I missed it. You're planning to include ggplot in future? No, I don't. No, uh, no. it's not uh, in the. Not. It's, all, it's not compatible. Okay, thank you. Right, thank you, Timothy. Excellent. Thank you. Um, if anyone has more questions, you're welcome to put still put them in the Q and A, and he can answer them at the end. Or, I'm on, the have... or on the Slack channel also. Oh, exactly. Simple. Yes. All right. So our next speaker is Andrea uh, Gilardi. He's from the University of Milan. Uh, he's a research fellow there. Um, and he's going to uh, share his presentation. His is a pre-recorded presentation, so he'll be playing um, the uh, pre-recording on his computer. Hi, everyone. I am Andrea Gilardi, and I'm here, to, I'm here to present a talk which is entitled OSM Extract, an R package to download, convert, and import large OpenStreetMap datasets. So this first slide here summarizes the process that led to the development of our package. In fact, the maintainers of this package are me and Robin Lovelace. And uh, I'm based in Milan, he's based in uh, Leeds. And we started, develop we started talking about this project more or less like two and a half years ago, chatting on a GitHub issue. And uh, that we started talking about the road network, the road network analysis and OpenStreetMap data. The first time that we spoke in person about uh, this project and several other things uh, was at uh, USAR in Toulouse in 2019, I think. So I think that more or less in these days, uh, we could celebrate the second birthday of this uh, project. Anyway, uh, as you may guess from the title of this presentation, uh, I want to introduce an R package that focuses on OpenStreetMap data. So first, I want to briefly present OpenStreetMap. OpenStreetMap is an online database that provides open access, geographic and rich attribute data worldwide. OpenStreetMap is the so-called Wikipedia of maps, and I think is the most important providers for raster and vector geographic data. The data stored in OpenStreetMap has a wide range of physical and human features, represent a wide range of physical and human features, including roads, rivers, buildings, constant lines, political and administrative boundaries. The data in OpenStreetMap is used by several public and private agencies, and I'm pretty sure it is used by hundreds of academic researchers in several fields. For example, at the end of this presentation, I will mention a few projects that I developed with Robin using OpenStreetMap data. So now we can mention, we can start talking about the package. The package can be installed from CRAN using the usual command, or the development version can be installed from GitHub using the install GitHub function in remotes. The package is stored in the ROpenSci meta repository. And for the moment, I just want to briefly mention the fact that most of the function in our package works better if the data is stored in a so-called persistent directory. This is important since if you store the data in a persistent directory, then the function in our package do not need to re-download the data every time that you need to analyze the data. So if you want to set the persistent directory, you should modify the R environment file and add the string as detailed in the slide. Then uh, after downloading the package, you can install the package and you can load the package and when you load the package the package raises an important message regarding the license associated to the OpenStreetMap data. This is quite important especially if you're working in a for-profit capacity since uh, there are some let's say legal aspects correlated to this, to this license. I don't want to speak here at the moment about this license but uh, we included a message that should uh, add several details about the li this license and some links for more information. So the data in OpenStreetMap is really rich and uh, I think that the data, the OpenStreetMap data can be obtained mainly in two ways. 
The first one is to use this whole overpass API to generate a query that can be used to run a query against the server and download some data. This approach is the approach adopted by the R package OSM data. And um, the other approach is using the so-called preformatted OpenStreetMap extracts to access extracts stored by external providers. <coughs> The most famous provider is probably Geofabric. And the idea behind these, uh, let's say, providers is that they divided the world in several uh, tiles. And for each tile, they store the data, the open data for that tile. For example, the tile may correspond to the different countries or the regions within a country. For the moment, we support uh, three providers that are called Geofabric, BBBike, and OpenStreetMap.fr. But uh, I mean, I don't want to add more details here about those providers. The only, if you want more details about these providers, we have a vignette in the package that uh, represent that, uh, let's say, add more details. Okay, now we can start talking about, about more, we can start introducing more detail about this package. The, the, the most important function of this package are summarized in this slide. And uh, the, the first four functions are used to manipulate the data. The fifth function is just a wrapper around all the other functions. So let's start. The first function, which is called OEMatch, is used to match an input place with one of the OSM extract stored by the providers. And then after matching the OSM extract, you want to download that OSM extract. And you can download that file using OE download. After downloading the file, you can convert the file between two different formats using OE Vector Translate. This is quite important since the data stored by the external providers is stored using, let's say, a size efficient format, which is this called the protocol buffer format, PDF. The problem is that this format is quite inefficient for performing the reading and input output, input output operations. So we decided to implement a function that is used to convert this, uh, let's say, uh, size efficient format to another more efficient format for reading the data, which is the so-called geopackage format. Finally, the OE read function is used just to, to import the data. And finally, the OE get function is just a wrapper around all the other function that runs all the steps in sequence and import the data. So now I will present some examples using OE get. This is the first example. And in this example, we run the function OE get using specifying that we want to import the data, the OSM data associated to the Isle of Wight. If we check the output, we can see that first the, uh, the function says that the input was matched with the OSM struct associated with the Isle of Wight. Then it, downloaded the, it, it downloads the data. Then it converts the data from the protocol buffer format to the geopackage format. And finally, it reads the data. Uh, I didn't mention it before, but the data returned by the function in our package are returned using this simple feature format, as you can read at the, from the bottom of this, uh, let's say this verbose output. There are several ways to perform these, let's say, matching operation. This, the first one is to use a character string specifying in the place. You can also perform a so-called spatial matching operation where you give a set of coordinates and this set of coordinates are paired using an, a special operation with an, OSM, with an OSM extract. For example, this operation is the same as before since these coordinates represent the centroid of the Isle of Wight. Again, the function says that the input was matched with the Isle of Wight. Then the function says that uh, it skips downloading the file. It skips on downloading the file since the OSM extract associated with the Isle of Wight was already downloaded in the previous step. So we do not, we do not need to rerun the, to re-download the same file. Again, uh, also the vector translate operation are skipped. And I think that this underlines the fact that it's quite important if you use our package to set the so-called persistent directory. And uh, last, if you run, let's say, this matching operation and you, you want to match an operation using 
a string that can't be matched with any of them extract. For example, here I say that they want to match using a character string that specifies the name of the small town where I live. Of course, there is no OSM extract for my specific town where I live. This is not important since when you specify a string that can't be matched with any OSM extract, then the function internally calls the nominative API to match the, to geolocate the place and then perform a special matching operation and to match this place with, with one of the OSM extracts. For example, I live in the north of Italy, and you can see that this small town was geolocated, and here I said searching for the location online, and the input was matched with the northwest OSM extract in the north of Italy. So, the most one, so the two most important parts for using OSM extract are the matching operation and the vector translate operation. The vector translate operation are quite important since if you tune the vector translate operation, you can analyze the small parts or la of large extracts uh, without, let's say, overloading your session. For example, here yeah, I presented an, I present an example where the, where in the vector translate operations we say we use the SQL, let's say the SQL syntax to select only the highways, so the roads where the highway attribute is not null. And on the right, we, we present, let's say, a representation of the output. We can also create a more detailed example. For example, e, again, I also use the SQL language to select only the highways that belong to the primary, secondary, and tertiary category. So let's say this is like a query to select the most important highway that belong to a specific area. And I mean, I think this is quite important. For example, I developed several projects in road safety analysis. And if you want to just focus on the most important roads in a certain area, this is quite important if you want to select those roads. And uh, for the moment, I cannot add more details on this topic, but, uh, but uh, we have um, in the packet, there is an, extens an extensive vignette that cover all these aspects. I just want to mention, briefly mention some of the new features that we recently introduced in this package. And we recently introduced two parameters called boundary and boundary type. These parameters can be used to perform the so-called spatial, spatial filters. And we will see two examples in a few slides. Uh, then we introduce a OE match pattern function, again, to improve the matching operation. We introduce an OE get keys function, or actually, no, we improve the OE get keys function. And uh, we created the logo. <laughs> this is the logo. And so for the boundary arguments, uh, the boundary argument can be used to perform the so called spatial filter. Here, the boundary argument should be specified using NSF object or simple feature column object using the lat long CRS. And in this case, if you specify the boundary arguments, then internally the vector translate operation are modifying, saying that uh, the, the, during the vector translate, the let's say the GDAL, oper the GDAL function should just uh, select the features that intersect that boundary. Here we can see an example where we highlight in red the highways that, inter that intersect a circular, by circular buffer, which is the, let's say, the black circle, which is centered in the most important city in the Isle of Wight. We can also slightly modify the special feature to also perform a clipping operation. So if we specify boundary, boundary equal to an area and boundary type equal to clip source, clip SRC, then this operation is slightly different than before, saying that we want to filter, we want to apply a special filter, and we want to clip the features. We are, I mean, you, if you compare the two maps, it's quite, it's quite clear that in the second map, we are also clipping the features according to the sec, according to this um, special filter. So to conclude, I want to mention a few um, projects that we developed using this package. In these uh, slides, in this first slide, I, will, I want to just mention two projects that were, that were developed by Robin. On the, right, on the left, we represent the speed limits of the routes in London, while on the right, we have the classification of the, cycle, of the cycleways in, the region of Nor in a region of Norway. And this is just to underline that OSM data are 
literally widespread, they cover several areas all over in the world, and they are also rich data since the, all the since the data stored in OpenStreetMap have several attributes describing this data. Two other projects that were developed by myself and Robin are summarized in this slide. So on the left, we have a representation of a road safety model for the road network in Leeds. On the right, we have uh, a, the analysis, also we have an estimation of the ambulance intervention that occurred in the road network of Milan. In both cases, the road network was derived using OpenStreetMap data and in fact our package. And we can see that on the left, we applied, let's say, a more strict filter selecting just the most important highways. On the right, we applied this less detailed filter, but in both cases, we have, in both cases, I mean, I mean, these are example where we applied both an SQL filter for select just specific roads and a spatial filter for selecting only the roads that lie in a city. Okay, so I have to conclude, and I want to, and I want to thank you very much for attending this presentation. I also want to thank you and thank you a lot to the OpenSci and the reviewers that help us develop this project and improve our package, and also all the other users that contributed to this project. So to conclude, I just want to say that uh, I'm really happy that uh, you want you plan to use OSM Extract for your project and that then you plan to use OSM data. And if you plan to use this package for any particular reason, please let us know if we can improve our package in any way. Again, I thank you very much for the attention. Thank you, Andrea. There is a question for you. Um, okay. we'll, we'll, uh, if anyone else has other, any other questions, you're welcome to put it in the Q&A and then we'll go back to uh, Rosa and Robin's uh, previous questions. Ah, there's two for you. Okay, so um, someone says, hello. Hi, Andrea, have you used the OSM data package and do you know how OSM extract is different from it? I used the OSM data package and it took quite a long time to download the data, so this passage, package looks great. Maybe you can comment on that. Okay, uh, I mean, yes, uh, I use the OSM data package uh, quite a lot. Uh, and uh, exactly, I mean, the problem that you mentioned is one, probably the main reason that uh, made us develop this package. In fact, I think that the approach that is adopted by, open, by OSM data is ideal for, let's say, smaller OSM extract. For example, if you want to focus on a small city, the approach adopted by OSM data is far, far superior than our approach. In, on the other hand, if you want to download the OSM data for a larger region, I don't know, a big city or a region or a country, then I think that our approach should or could perform better than the approach adopted by OSM data. We are running some comparison in these days and we plan to, to let's say, publish the comparison in a few days. Wonderful. So keep your eye out for that. And there's another question here uh, from Liam. He says, are you considering adding functions for cleaning OSM data, for example, clean geometry names? Uh, I'm not sure what you mean by geometry names, but for the moment there are no functions for cleaning geometry for cleaning OSM data, since I think that the package should, let's say, focus on, only on importing the data. Each maybe we can consider import. We can consider adding this function to also manipulate the data while it's being imported. For example, um, I mean, I didn't mention all the example here, but uh, the, 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 the I mean, there are some possibilities to also filter and select just some, or say, some rows and some colors that that satisfy some uh, conditions. Excellent. Not sure if I answer the question. Otherwise, please send me a message. Yeah. Uh, Liam, if you if you want something more specific, you're welcome to um, add your Q and A again. Okay. Um, uh, Andrea, I'll call you again if there's some more questions for you. I'm going to go to the questions that we couldn't get to for Robin and Rosa. I see Robin is back. Um, Robin, there is a question on your slope package. Uh, can the slope package calculate the direction of the slope? Um, the slope meaning is the slope downhill in a direction, uphill in another direction?
so I can try to answer that. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, yeah, so that's that's a, an issue that's already open in our GitHub repo. Uh, it's something that's really important to have, uh, in particular if you are assessing um, uh, roots um, roots uh, choice, right? I mean, it's totally different to go uphill or downhill. Uh, so uh, yeah, that's a, a feature that we want to add maybe as an argument of uh, slopes, uh, slopes uh, X, Y, Z, but I don't know if Robin wants to add something. It's not probably here. But yeah, that, that's something that's, that we, we already thought about that. Uh, and if you want to contribute, uh, please go to the GitHub repo. Okay. Um, the next question is from Michael. It says, nice talk and nice slopes package. Thanks. Um, I am a hydrologist. Would it be possible to calculate slopes of catchments or hills? You mentioned rivers, but this is a line feature. And if so, is a DEM needed as a raster or can also online data like OSM be used? Um, so I think Robin has probably Michael. Ah, hi, can yeah. you hear me now? So yeah, finally. Um, yeah, so that's a great question about um, using it in other areas. The one thing about the slopes package is it's quite specifically focused on linear features and often hydrologists use raster data to, to represent um, river systems. So it kind of depends on the input data. If you represent a river network as a series of lines, um, maybe the center points, and maybe even the, um, the boundaries of the river, then absolutely um, it, it, it could be used to calculate the steepness of different segment, segments of that river network especially like when you've got a waterfall or something, I think it could be used to detect where you've got particularly steep sections like waterfalls, um, but it's not useful in the way that uh, if you've got an entire system to um, assess the slope at every single point on the map, it's more about the slope associated with specific uh, line strings and the center points, um, the central line of rivers. So, um, yeah, but we'd be interested to, to see how it ca could be used in river network analysis. So, yeah, I mean, feel free to open an issue on the uh, GitHub and we can take a look at that. So I hope that answers your question. Thank you, Robin. Um, all right, there's a last question from Omar. Uh, does the package calculate the slope in degrees? So it currently calculates in um, not degrees, in percentage, right? Yeah, yeah. So currently it's a percentage, which is um, for every step, for every one hundred meters or every one hundred centimeters uh, along the the path. How many centimeters does it go up? So one percent means that you're climbing 1% for every 100 meters you're going along. And you can act, that's why you can go over 100%. So 100% means 45 degrees. Simple trigonometry can translate. But it's actually a good point. People might find it useful to have the output in degrees. So I guess we could add a, an argument that's like units equals degrees. So that would be be possible. So yeah, another like good, uh, I'd see that as a feature request and I think we could probably do that. Excellent. Any more questions from the attendees? You're welcome to pop a question in. We have two minutes or so. I would like to ask a question of Lucas if, he's, if he is still here. Yes, your your SF networks package. To what extent? How big a network can it can it handle? Um, before before it before your computer is gonna mine. Um, 
It depends a bit, as always. Um, I think Andrea might also be able to answer this more specifically because I know that he has, I think, important uh, the whole city of London, which is was quite a large network, or, or and already like around fifteen thousand edges, um, and actually creating them, creating them network out of that goes quite fast. Um, but of course, then if you want to do maybe um, intersections, uh, things like this, that might take a long time. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, no, I try. For, for example, I mean, I run several examples and several tests for models. And I mean, if you just want to, let's say, create the, let's, let's call it SF network object, it works also for the Greater London data. And the Greater London data is like more than 700,000 edges. So, I mean, it's a monumental, let's say, road network. The problem is that, uh, of course, if you want to do something usable starting from that road network, Network is totally unfeasible to work with a network that large. Usually, I work with um, let's say five, fifty, 50,000 edges more or less, and in those cases, maybe it takes a few minutes to run, let's say, all the centrality and all the measures, but uh, it should run smoothly. I mean, you know, all cases that let's say are. Uh, relevant uh, outside of just simply creating an object, I think they're running fine. So I think that in my opinion, the problem is not just creating the SF network object. The problem is that uh, all the subsequent steps uh, are, let's say, much more difficult than creating the SF network object. And I think it should scale uh, pretty fine. Yeah, maybe, Thank you. Maybe one thing I can add to that is that our goal with the package is mainly to create a package and like to create an API that is easy to use and easy to understand. Um, and our like and I do think that if you want to work with a huge network and do many to many shortest path um, calculations on, on a really big net network, then probably our package is not the tool that you should choose. Then you should choose maybe another R package like Dodger or C or C plus plus routing that is really only focused on this task, and they can do that really really fast. So if you have large networks and really one goal, I only want to do this, then our package might not be your best choice because our focus is more set in creating something general purpose that's easy to understand, easy to use, and easy to work with. As F and the other. Tidyverse uh, packages. Wonderful. Okay, I'm going to thank the speakers for the session one last time. That was really excellent, and I um, I feel quite honoured to have been able to chair the session. So up next there is a yoga. Um, uh, a session if you need some calm and meditation. Uh, there is also an R Ladies community meeting, and then after that, there are some uh, talks which you can also find on Slack. And just um, last, thank you again. The sponsor for the session is R Studio, and I think we really appreciate that sponsorship. And uh, I'll thank the speakers again. Thank you very much, and thank you thank for you. all the attendees today. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.